Let's move along to our next guest. Like I said, head coach for Henry Cejudo. He was so very happy on August 4th. I saw him. Henry gave him the belt. One of the most char colorful characters in the game. A man who I slighted last year when I didn't even put him in my, in my breakdown for the top coaches. When I even put him on the short list. I didn't even put him in the honorable mentions. And he has used that as motivation and he's shoving it down my throat. It is long overdue that we have Captain Eric Albaracin on this program. So let's go to the Magic of Skype and say hello to the captain. There he is. How are you, sir? Hey, good to see you. I made it happen, Ariel. I made it happen. You were worried. You did make it happen. Uh, congratulations, Eric. I'm very happy for you and the team. You are in Brazil right now, right? Right, right. Uh, I'm in Brazil. I'm in uh, Paulo Costa's uh, hometown. And by the way, if there's a, do you hear a little bit of feedback when you speak? A little bit. Um, to eliminate that, maybe just uh, make the volume lower. Okay. That will help you if you want. Yeah. How's this? Yeah. I mean, it's more for you than for me, but does it sound better? Yes. Okay, cool. So uh, you have been all over the place. I've seen you guys. You're, you're doing. You're, you're you're by Henry's side, but I see you doing. You know, interviews in L.A. I see you doing stuff in Mexico. Now you're in Brazil. Have you slept since you won? Since you guys won a couple of weeks ago? I feel like you've been all over yeah. the world. Yeah, I don't think either of us slept. You know, Henry, Henry and I immediately went on. A, started going on a tour. We went to Miami. He met Michael Jordan. He met Derek Jeter. Um. Then we took off to L.A., and we did the TMZ show there. We faced off. We saw Mario Lopez. Uh, we faced off T.J. Dillashaw. I don't know how that came about. I think they were – they scheduled them at the same time, so so uh, I think that was kind of planned. But whether it was planned or not, they faced off. And then we did TMZ, and then we actually went to the Ultimate Fighter to check out the Ultimate Fighter 28, and, and we checked out – uh, Kelvin Gastelum's team. Wow. And and then, then we went to Mexico City and did another, a couple 14-hour media days with Univision, Televisa. And then now here I am in, uh, I'm in, uh, back to work though. Ooh. So now I'm, uh, I'm here, we're getting Paulo Costa ready for Yoel. Now, when... The did, soldier of God. Yes, yes. And we'll get to that in a second. But um, when did you meet Michael Jordan? When uh, I didn't meet him, Henry did. Okay. Uh, Michael Jordan wouldn't allow anybody else in. So uh, where was Henry this? Henry got to go into uh, Derek Jeter's, the owner's box, and he and and Michael Jordan was in there. Wow! Did he know who so he was? Three goats. Had he had he heard of him? I've never met him, and I know Henry was real excited. But, you know, out of everybody, Hammer was probably really excited to meet Julio Cesar Chavez. Wow. The boxer. So we got to meet him as well, and that was, that was, a, big, that was a big one. I'm you, a big fan of his, too. You were very confident going into the fight. Uh, we spoke briefly before the fight. Why were you – no one has ever been able – you know, like very few people have been able to even win a round against DJ at 125, let alone beat him, of course. He was undefeated. Why were you so confident going into this fight? And, you know, I, I, I just see Henry had, has a self-belief. You know, I've seen Henry been uh, chasing greatness really for a long time. So we've been chasing this for 10 years. Ever since he won the Olympic gold medal, uh, to be at this level at this uh, for such a long time, it, it, it's not easy. It, it, chasing greatness involves evolution and uh, you have to demand evolution, and demanding evolution requires growth. And growing requires living on the edge of comfort, discomfort. And that's what we did. You know, we went, we went everywhere. We went to Singapore. To, uh, we went to Thailand to learn Muay Thai. We went to Holland to learn kickboxing. We went to Brazil. You know, we're uh, home of jiu-jitsu, the land of warriors, and started training with the Pitbull brothers. And, um, you know, we did jiu-jitsu there, karate there as well. So we just, we unturned every stone. We brought science in. We brought, um, he had never been lighter. He had never been stronger. In three weeks of using uh, the Neural Force One program, he had put a, he had gained like 28% of his functional threshold power, his FTP. They did a test and he, he's the only one ever to, uh, to improve so much in three weeks. 
So I, I just saw saw all that together. It's like nobody's gonna beat this guy. We're gonna unleash a beast inside that cage and one the door. He's gonna take care of business. Okay, so you're that confident. Everything's peaking. Everything's going the right way. What's going through your mind? When it seems like he can't stand on his ankle, you know, it, 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 it's going out on him. He's been kicked in the leg, and it's 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 almost like Michael Chandler, Brent Primus all over again. What is going through your mind at that point? It's a, exactly what you just said, Ariel Hawani. Is uh, I remember the Brett Primus, what happened when Brett Primus and Michael Chandler fought in Bellator, because I have a lot of fighters in Bellator, and actually I was at that fight, and or I watched that fight, I'm sorry, and... I remember watching it because Patricky Pitbull possibly would have to fight the winner of that fight. So when he got hurt, everybody had thought he just broke his ankle, broke his foot, something had happened, but nobody knew for sure. And the only way I knew was because on that Monday he was on your show. And I remember watching your shows for that specific reason was to find out what happened to his, his ankle. And, it, and he said, you know, it was his peron peroneal nerve at the top of the fibular head and that you know it went it goes numb like a funny bone in your elbow and and that's what happened and i remember seeing henry get kicked there barely kicked but it was immediate when his ankle started buckling and i just remember watching your show and i remember on your show what he said was uh they stopped well they stopped the fight first of all but part of it was because michael chandler went for the kill you know, he, his leg was hurt, but he didn't care, and he just went for the kill. And that he didn't allow his time for his foot to recover, to get that, that feeling back, the nerve dysfunction. So what we had Henry do was switch stances instead of we had to change the game plan. So we had to switch stances, and he had to go left to your southpaw, which he never has done in a fight. And re really, he rarely ever trained it in, uh, in training camp was going lefty just a couple times. But because I saw your show, I knew it was at the back of the knee and not his foot. So when we went in there, I brought the ice. And when I told uh, Santino, the, uh, Coach Santino to put the ice on the back of his knee, not his ankle, because I, I know what this is what happened to Michael Chandler. So thank God we watched your show. Wow. And thank God I found out because now that's the second time that you've helped with uh, – uh, one of my fighters getting in UFC title fights. The first one was Betsy, Betsy Correa. And uh, I want to thank you for that one, too. How did I help with that one? Why? Because I'm the, Betsy Correa had the fight. Yes. One of the four horsewomen, but she never knew what the four horsewomen was. But I knew because I'm a big wrestling fan. So when I told her, after you beat Jessamine Duke, you have to do this, <laughs> she really didn't understand it. And only uh, one person understood it. Ronda Rousey did. And there was no post-fight interview. But she did do this in the camera, but nobody really picked it up. Yeah. So I remember grabbing you in Baltimore and telling you, I said, hey, did you see that Betsy did this? And you already knew. You were like, oh, my God, she challenged the four horsewomen. She's going after Ronda. And then you wrote an article. The next week, she had the uh, Shayna Baszler, the fight date approved. And she was fighting within a couple months. And then after that fight, she was already doing the... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She was going for the belt. And you know the, the rest is history. But if you don't write that article, nobody understood what this meant. So that's two times. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, me and you work together. We do. We, we work well together. We do. I, I remember I've said I've said this story on this program. It's your first time as a guest on the program. You've been in uh, in studio with Paulo Costa in the past. But when, when when you came up to me, my flight was my flight was canceled after UFC 134. I'm at the Noguera Brothers Gym in Rio because I couldn't go home. After UFC 134, you came up to me with a piece of paper and you wrote Yoel Romero's name on it and you said, this guy is going to be a future UFC champion. Remember his name. Now, he has yet to become a UFC champion, but holy smokes, did you call it? He was he was pre-Strike Force at the time. You nailed it. You you were you were 100% on the Yoel because you knew him from the wrestling days, right? Yeah, I've known Yoel since he was 17 and he's just always been amazing to watch and great personality and he's... Uh, yeah, I, I remember uh, watching him at the World Cup in, in in Oklahoma State a long time ago. He was about 17 years old. And I remember all these cowboy boosters 
these rich oil cowboys would come up to me and like ask me if I could speak Spanish and translate, and they all wanted him to transfer from Cuba or to uh, immigrate from Cuba and be, and be on the OSU football team. They weren't even talking about wrestling. They wanted wow. him to play football. Wow, that is wild. Um, yeah, a, it was uh, it was funny. What a great scene after that we got to see with, with Henry giving you the belt. Um, he said that he wanted to quit after UFC 177, that he wanted to get out of the car and leave in Sacramento when he couldn't make weight, and you're the one who convinced him to stay. How serious did it did it seem? Like, did, did, did you really think that this guy was done, this Olympic gold medalist, youngest in, in American history, that he was actually going to quit before ever fighting inside the UFC octagon? Oh, man. You know, at that point, it, it, you know, I got a phone call at 7 in the morning saying Henry's missing. So we were like, oh, no, where'd he go? And we, I went to, like, four different hospitals looking for him, making sure he didn't put the IV. Yeah. Because uh, he was only four over when he went to sleep. And uh, we went looking for him. And finally, we found him, and we brought him back to Bert and Sean. And, you know, he just said he was real dehydrated. He wasn't thinking straight. But I was believing what he said. You know, usually Henry speaks his mind, and you got to believe what he thinks. Um, and he said, I'm done. I don't love it. When he said, I don't love it like I do wrestling, then I was like, wow, are we forcing this kid to fight when he doesn't really want to fight? And But I was like, no, that's not true. I go, I know you. I go, you're going to be world champ one day. This is just this is just an obstacle, a speed bump. I go, this is just the weight cut talking. And I, he ran, you know. He's like, I'm out of here. He wouldn't even stay in the city. He's like, I'm going home. Uh, and he's like, I'm done. Tell He's like, I'm retiring. And I ran after him. And uh, he says I was holding on the door and, like, trying to yell at him and convince him. And uh, I remember sending him a lot of WhatsApp messages and voicemails telling him, uh, just telling him not to quit, basically, that you're going to be champ one day. You just got to believe this is, this is just, you know, this is the first part of MMA, you know, making weight. This is, this is just a, a, a bump in the road. You know, he was supposed to fight Scott Jorgensen, and that was his first fight in the UFC. And Scott was a, is a real tough fighter. So uh, Henry's been thrown to the fire ever since his first fight in the UFC. You know, and I, maybe that, that was a lot of pressure, maybe the weight, but whatever he was, he, he, at that moment he thought he was done, but thank God we, uh, we changed his mind, and look where we're at now. It's unbelievable. And now we're pushing a TJ Dillashaw fight. I have to, you know I'm honest with you. I don't love this fight. I, I I don't like this this era of you win the belt and and it gives you a ticket to go anywhere. I think the immediate rematch is what has to happen. Why am I wrong in your opinion? Well, one thing is I think uh, Mighty Mouse is hurt. He's yeah. pretty hurt. His, his his knee, his LCL, his foot. But one the other thing was I think Henry had it in his mind um, that they were looking over him so much. You know, there, he did an interview the night before. You know, he went to media day, and I think uh, the week of the fight, and there was eight questions to Mighty Mouse, and before the, and they never once asked about about Henry. It was all about who's his next fight. Is it going to be T.J. Dillashaw? Super fight, super fight. So I think part of that was um, him just like he was upset that they were overlooking him, and then now that he 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 made the super fight. Become a super loss. He threw, inserted himself into the super fight, and and I think that's how that happened. And, you know, I think he wants to. I tell you the truth, Henry did not get a lot of money for this fight. Um, everybody told him don't take the fight, but Henry knew. Nobody knows this, but Henry had a a very low, uh, almost a pay cut to take this fight, and they were like, well, you don't have to take it, but he felt if you don't take it. They're going to give it to Formiga, and then Formiga, at this point, Pettis and Benavides hadn't fought yet, but it, it could have been the winner of that. And then also TJ, so that's three fights. That could be a year and a half to two years. And he goes, you know what? I'm not in it for the money. I'm in it for the legacy. I'm taking this fight now. I'm 31 years old. I'm at the top. I'm stronger than ever. I'm doing it. I don't care what the money is. And he took the fight on a – really, he didn't really like – he didn't negotiate anything. Wow, pay cut? How could how could he how could he take it on a pay cut when he's fighting for the belt in the co-main event? How does that happen? 
Man, like I said, the, his agent, you know, nobody, everybody was like, you shouldn't be taking it for less than this much. You, he's probably fought for the lowest. He probably fought for the lowest salary and in, in, for a title for a long time. Wow. He probably, he probably made less than Sage Northcutt. Wow. Wow. That is wild. Um, do you, yeah, so, do you, okay. But about, like I said, it was about him. As a coach, when I heard him say, it's not about the money, I'm going to beat him and it's going to be about the legacy. The money will come later and goes, I'm going to beat him now. This is what I have to be done. When he told me that, I could see the confidence and the belief deep within his heart and soul. And I know he would be able to show the extent of his will. And if something happened in the fight where it came down to it, between will against will, he would he would win. And, and you saw that happen in that first round. You know, most people would have, most people might not have made it out that round with that foot like that. I remember Jeff. Matter of fact, Scott Jorgensen, I think, had something like that too, and he kept fighting. But, but the fact I think when we switched to southpaw, it allowed him to recover. And he by the end of the round, he was almost a hundred. He was about eighty percent. Whereas if you go in for the kill, that foot never recovers. The guy kicks you again, and it makes it worse. Or the ref, or the ref stops it and brings the doctors in to look at it. So I think uh, we made we did the right decision. I saw that he met with Dana White last week. He took a little picture with him, posted on Instagram. Is he getting more money now as champion? You know what? I, uh, I you know what? I think they met for like two hours. Okay. And uh, I, you know, I'm from what I understood, they didn't even talk about, almost didn't even talk about fighting. Oh. So, uh, but you know, Dana White says, "Man, you're gonna get. We're in a year." It's gonna go up for sure. Okay. You yeah. know, no, no specific numbers were given, but you know, he he made Henry feel happy. All right. So is the TJ fight next? Do you feel like it's next? Is there a real possibility here? It feels like there's momentum here all of a sudden. And as you mentioned, you know, the whole thing happens on extra and all that. I mean, I don't know. It, it, I, I'm starting to get a premonition. What 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 could you tell us? Is it actually happening? Well, I think with the the fact that they put them on the same show they put them on tmz together i mean when i was on tmz i felt like we were coming out to jerry springer they were like pumping them up right before the tmz you guys can say whatever you want be ready to go out there so it was uh i was like wow they're really pushing this they're not even supposed to fight there's no date marked but they're tmz was pushing it mario lopez looked like uh separating the fighters looking like like dana white he had TJ and uh, Henry, you know, uh, beefing it out right there on the set. So that's what it looks like to me. I'm down. I, we've been, uh, we ever since we lost to uh, um, Joe to Benavidez, we've been wanting, we've been wanting this fight for a while. Uh, when when TJ said he wanted to come down to to fight DJ, I remember Henry sent a message, a text message saying. No, if, if DJ won't fight him, I will. This is my weight class. Something like that. So I remember he sent that message to Dana White, and that was back in 2017. So we've been preparing for uh, for a fight like with them for a while. How soon does he want to return? I'm thinking December. Okay. All right. I think they were trying to push. I think that Madison Square Garden, I think that one's a they, yep. they had mentioned that, but I'm not sure if they were really going to push for it. That would be November. Yeah, that one's a little bit faster. So I don't I don't really think they're pushing for that, but I think TMZ was. Yeah, actually. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know how much. I don't know if they got as much clout as you. Well, they're in with the UFC, so that that's good for them. Um, okay, so then if, if you had to guess, would you say it's TJ? Yeah, I, I think it's TJ. Wow. I think it's – I think that ball got rolling, so – that's wild. All right. Well, we'll see what happens. By the way, Paulo Costa, Yo Romero, when's that fight happening? Wow. You know, I thought it was going to happen, Madison Square Garden, but apparently it's, I don't know the date, but yeah. I'm here. Yeah. I don't know if it's getting moved out to December, maybe the new year. I don't know. Well, the good thing I is. I haven't even gotten to see Paulo. I just arrived. Okay. So uh, from here, I'll go to Natal in a few days and train the Pitbull Brothers. But now I'm going to get a. Uh, Get Paulo ready for your well. We'll uh, we'll focus on wrestling the next in this week, and you know, focus on all the all the weak weaknesses and strengths that 
Yoel has and that Paulo has. Uh, it comes full circle for us here because you were the one who first told me about Yoel, and now you're preparing your your protege to fight Yoel. We'll talk to you all later in the show, so we'll get his take on everything that's going on, if he's fighting on November 3rd or not. For you, Eric, uh, to the best of my knowledge, this is your first UFC champion, correct? Well, yes. Like, as a head coach, yeah. You yeah. know, I mean, I was on Team Noguera. Right. Uh, back in 211, I mean, Anderson was uh, the champion still. And then Junior Dos Santos won while he was part of Team Noguera as well. So, But this is a little different. But like, official, like, head coaching of the camp. Somebody that I've been bleeding and sweating and crying for like in tears for 10 years or 14 years, really, is uh, this was definitely my first and 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 best. Do you feel do you feel like like is it vindication, validation? Do you, do you feel like you have now reached a different stratosphere as far as coaching is concerned, a new level of respect as well? I hope so. I hope so. I mean, we're not in it for that. I'm always in it for uh, just for, I have the same dream as my athletes do. But, you know, when it, when we're going against, against the, the best duo, the dynamic duo in MMA, like Matt Hume and, and Mighty Mouse, you know, I, I have such respect for Matt Hume and he's like the wizard. And I, this is why I really studied Matt Hume to be able to compete with him was actually a challenge for me. So I knew that. They always said DJ was like a, it's like a video game and DJ is the character, but the guy with the joystick is Matt Hume. So what I did was hmm. I told one of our video editors to, I want every minute interval between rounds, everything that uh, Matt Hume has said to, to, to Mighty Mouse from the WEC days all the way up to when he beat Ray Borg. I want every wow. minute interval, every advice he's ever given them. And I studied that. I didn't even watch the fights. Um, I had watched the fights, obviously, but they made that clip of only Matt Hume's advice to to Mighty Mouse, and I studied that, and I felt that was like a challenge. Like I'm trying to beat the best. This is like the uh, the head coach of the the New England Patriots, Bill Belichick. You know, you're going against him, so I felt like I had to raise my game to his level, and I had to. I, we had to adapt. We had, in the fight, just like they made adaptions. And you know we we got we got three of the five rounds. Wow, what a story! That's amazing. Good on you, my man. You you have reached that new level, in my opinion. It's cool to see you getting the respect that you deserve. Um, I know that it's been a long time coming. Appreciate you coming on, Eric. Congrats on all your success. Congrats on the win, and good luck with training camp. You got a boatload of fighters coming up as well. I know it's not just the two that we talked about. The Pitbull sure. brothers. We got, we got Roger Huerta, the Pitbull brothers. And then Leandro's fighting Aaron Pico. That's going to be one to watch, too. Yes, I look forward to that. What a big fight that is for Bellator as well. Uh, thank you, Eric. I, I don't know if I just lost him there. Did I lose you, Eric? No, you're right here. Shalom. Shalom, my brother. Shalom. We'll talk to you soon, my man. Uh, great to have you on the program. Uh, all right. That was a lot of fun. Captain Eric Albaracin, one of the uh, most colorful characters in the game, if you will, and also one of the best coaches as well. And it's very cool to see him start to get that respect that he has long deserved, in my opinion.